All right, this is Escape from Bloodbath Island, a.k.a. Paradise Lost, a.k.a. the most difficult movie ever undertaken by Full Circle, would you say? Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't have been, but it... No, it probably should have been. It, it should With the exteriors and all that stuff. I don't think so. I, I, I think it, it shouldn't have, but it just was. <laughs> it became the toughest one. Whatever the rationale, it, it, it was. It was. Yeah. It was. So, this is uh, Sean Weathers, accompanied by Aswadi, so... Yeah. Any movie can be tough that requires a lot of people in the same place at the same time. Um, Location-wise, we, ch- we just didn't choose the right place to shoot it. There was just constant noise. We, we shot in a part of Brooklyn that is somewhat um, isolated, but there's a little, like, landing strip nearby where these kids um, fly their... Adults. Adults and kids, actually, mostly adults, who just fly these toy airplanes that are very, very noisy, and it it just was killing our audio. So um, virtually everything we shot had audio problems from, from top to bottom. Oh, except this, because there is no audio. Yeah. Your you... boy Gilo didn't uh, believe that this uh, needed audio for whatever reason. Yeah. I think he still didn't know how to use it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, even ambient sound would have been nice here, like, you know, mm-hmm. in the background. I'm and sure this... we would have heard airplanes, though, but still. Yeah. And this here was supposed to be, like, the ending sequence of him running. And we had sort of like a Planet of the Apes ending where he was going to appear at a place in lower Brooklyn where you could see um, Manhattan and the Statue of Liberty. So, I, I mean, I, I honestly think to this day the ending of it was a very good ending and it was pretty interesting. Um, this sequence would have been nice if he, you know, if we could have finished it off at least. But, yeah. Um, this it's interesting. We have the entire ending sequence almost. Yeah. <laughs> the whole, the whole, everything that leads up to it, we, we, we kind of failed at. So. Yeah. But this, this looks pretty good though, visually. It yeah, was, it was it nice. was it was definitely interesting. I wasn't here. I wasn't doing any camera work at this point. I was probably either on my way to Radio Shack trying to recharge the batteries or picking somebody up, dropping somebody. I was more of a PA on this shoot actually. We 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 were the problems were numerous. Not only the audio as we spoke about, but this was our first time using the Panasonic um, DVX camera, the 24P camera. And we didn't know how to use it. We were just learning. And the person who owned the camera didn't know either. So we spent the majority of the morning figuring out how to use the camera. And also the person who owned the camera didn't charge the batteries. So when we showed up, we had one battery that was maybe one quarter full and another that was a half full. And they just seemed to use up very, very fast. So. We did what we could on a beach that was in Queens, and then we came back to this location in Brooklyn. By the time we got here, both of the batteries were gone. So I had to take the battery to, to uh, Radio Shack and, um, and charge it. And we just basically stood around for like two hours playing football. <laughs> and then when one of the batteries uh, was charged, I, ran, I, I drove back to Radio Shack, picked it up, and came back and started shooting. And by that time I had to go back and get the other battery. So my memories of most of these scenes are just, you know, very, very minimal. Yeah, this was a scene that um, me and Gilo shot again. We shot that that sequence you guys just saw as well. Um, this this guy in here on the, um, on the right, who you saw running before Brian, he's actually one of my favorite actors I work with, despite the fact that I didn't work with him long. I just kind of like clicked with him. I just liked his whole um, his whole attitude. He had a positive yeah. attitude. He seemed willing to do whatever it took. Mm-hmm. Never complained at all. Mm-hmm. And he, he was working on like a little sleep too because he went to school and he get a job. He was just like a, a busy guy, but he was always there. He's a young guy too. He was, he was like, like 18 or 19. Yeah, like 18 time. or 19. And he, he was interesting. He's one of, he's like a real New Yorker. He was like a young guy from Staten Island who was real, like a real New Yorker. The, the types you don't, you don't find a lot. I mean, most of the people that you, you find in acting are like these out-of-state people or these metrosexual types, and they're, they're real kind of, you know, like, high and mighty. He was a real, like, 
like a working class, blue collar, kind of like the New Yorkers you would you would say are stereotypical. So he, he kind of had that whole presence, and he was just really like you know laid back, cool kind of guy that we definitely wanted to work with more. But he um, was he's like the, uh, a guy who could have been a typical like full circle regular yeah. player. He's like the meat and potatoes kind of guy. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, we lost contact with him because he's a somebody who could have been in several projects. Easily, easily. Yeah. But this guy standing next to him, I forgot his name. He is not someone who should have ever been in a full circle. Yeah, he's movie. he's more of what you get when you when you get <laughs> look for actors in New York. It's like some pretty boy who's like you know real touchy and feminine and sensitive, has a ponytail. Yeah. Yeah. This scene looks a little um, a little murky because I actually cropped it several times mm -hmm. just so you could see the actors a little bit better. That was a big back and forth we had in, on the cinematography of the movie as well. Mm. You wanted like extremely wide shots. I wanted to see the characters more. Yeah, we, we, we just couldn't come to any conclusion on that. I mean, I, I wanted it to be very like, you know, wide and voyeuristic and like that whole perspective and you wanted it to be more of a conventional look because really with all of our early movies, we um, we had various different looks in terms of cinematography. Um, so this one, I was thinking, okay, very wide, and I thought that's what we were going to do, but when we got to the set, you were like, no, 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 shoot him a lot closer. And, I mean, it's not that one style was, was better than the other. It's just that we couldn't figure out what we were going to do. And yeah, it's, it's not right or wrong. It's being on the same page a lot with movies. Yeah. There is no right or wrong with making a movie because it's not a one plus one equals two. It's just... It's just, you know, opinions and directions to go in. So. This was the one day we actually got everybody together, um, <coughs> besides from beside rehearsals. Um, there was one guy who was actually missing, the guy who was supposed to play the killer. And if we got him here, we may have been able to squeeze out a few more scenes. But um, this, this was an accomplishment, getting all of these people together at the same place at the same time. And this was probably the only day that this actually happened. Um, every other time we decided to shoot, um, somebody seemed to be missing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's funny, the, the one thing I remember about this movie is that this was the first movie where I rehearsed the entire movie in, in sequential order, from the first scene to the last. Every time I rehearsed with the with the um, with the the cast, yeah, it would just be like a couple hours. We just go through all the scenes. Yeah. We spent a lot well of time. Rehearsed movie. Well yeah, rehearsed. we spent a lot of time rehearsing this because this this was um we, we were shooting this in the summer when I was living in the, um in downtown Brooklyn, and we used to rehearse outside because there was too many people here for my apartment to to hold and it was too hot up there. So you guys used to be downstairs like every night, like six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, rehearsing it and. I mean, everybody should have known their lines inside out yeah. you know, for this one, definitely. Well, two things I remember in particular. This was pretty recently after I'd come off my depression. I remember that. And also, this was like a point in my life where I got probably the least sleep I ever went on before. I mean, I would sleep like an hour a night, which is rare for me. Um, but yeah, it just seemed like I was just consumed with this movie. Yeah, like you were getting 24, very, very seven. Well very little sleep especially i remember the night before we started shooting we were doing stuff all day and then i know we went to pathmark you bought some food and then you had to go home and you had to make the food and i think call time was like 4 a.m yeah so i remember like um i remember like you leaving my apart like from where we were like around 11, 30, 12 o'clock, then you had to go home, you made the food, and you probably were just so like anxious and stressed out, even if you did lay down, it wouldn't have went very far. No, it wouldn't have. And, That's um, why, this part of the reason I couldn't sleep, it was just yeah. a lot of anxiety. And then you'd show up in my, in my crib at like four in the morning, and you just had to stand around and wait for everybody to show. <laughs> And that was always that could have been time I could have been getting some rest, but I, I yeah. had to be there. That was a whole process. I used to just stay upstairs and sleep, and I'm like, I wish dude. I was in that position. Yeah, but I wasn't getting a whole a lot of hours. I was like, dude, just call me when everybody's here. Yeah. And those were days like before I was really able to get up early, early in the morning. I mean, now it probably would be a lot easier, but in those days, getting up at like four in the morning for me was just like hell. Yeah. Here we go with another scene. Oh. This girl is actually, she actually plays a character from the brunette, a brunette you saw in the previous scene. Mm -hmm. um, the brunette 
dropped off and then she took her place. So she was part of like a, a second cast, I guess. <laughs> She is. She's. She was a horrible, horrible actress. She couldn't even scream right. I know. She looked like she never saw the sun before in her life. She was so pale. Yeah, it was transparent. But uh, I don't know if you guys can tell. The lens is really dirty I, here. I didn't shoot. You could look at her scene. black shirt. You could see like there's like a bunch of stuff. Where was I this day? Because this isn't my camera work, obviously. <laughs> this is Lopez. Yeah. But um, uh, uh, Jeff actually got sick this day. I think. He did. Laying in the water so long. Yeah. Affected his sickle cell. Yeah. He was. He was really odd of it he was like hospitalized after this yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and i don't know what i think it was because like he didn't have a change of clothes or something and it wasn't so much the water it was like after the scene he didn't change and he was like wearing the wet clothes for like a long time and it just it just caught him i wasn't here on this day what was the story with this day because i don't remember really anything here i think you were here this day but i don't know i don't think he shot the scene mm -hmm. but um yeah this is another it, this is another cropped one. This was a much wider shot that I cropped as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, I probably get in see a little bit of TNA maybe with mm -hmm. a closer shot. What was I having like personal drama this day or something? I don't know. You were going through a lot of issues during this shoot personally. Yeah, and this is this was my <laughs> amongst other issues on set and camera issues. And I think I was having some personal drama going on because even when I was on the set, I think I was just so like preoccupied with like other bullshit going on in my life that um you know i i just wasn't fully there and i think this was also the summer when i think i was maybe transitioning like in some of the things i was doing in my career as well yeah the funny thing about this movie i remember shooting a lot of stuff with like these characters like this guy and this girl and just like i shot scenes with some of the people i wanted to get rid of the most as opposed to shooting with the people like Brian and Nefra and Backdoor Michelle, because I just thought they'd be more reliable and come back. Um, in hindsight, if I never knew I'd finished the movie, obviously I wouldn't have done it at all, but another thing I would have done is maybe shot a little bit more of the more exciting stuff and see what Brian could do to a Nefra or a Backdoor in a love scene. Yeah. <laughs> but again, my thinking was that I would get the movie done and let me get rid of these guys because I just couldn't stand them. Yeah. So let me get their scenes out the way first. And this was a hard movie to get rid of anybody because you just needed... To, every, there was so much interaction between all the characters. Like, we, we, we shot House of the Damned and Lust for Vengeance and um, they almost die in a certain way that a lot of people were together at the same time. So with this movie, we didn't really see that as being an issue. So there were all types of different character interactions going on. So it was very hard in those days to get to truly get rid of somebody without having other people there as well to interact with them in scenes. And I think, I mean, this is where we really learned a big lesson of like, hey, you know, we really have to streamline our scripts to have characters that we know are around and characters that we can just get rid of in one day. So this, this was definitely like a big learning lesson for us where you just can't write a script and have everybody talking to everybody because it makes it very hard to get rid of any one character. And for, to get rid of even one of them, you'd have to have other characters there all day waiting around as well, and you may lose other people based on that. Even people you think that you can trust maybe, you know, might, might get tired. This is actually, I think, is your old camera, and this might have been you just doing some handheld footage with it because you could see the quality of the video looks a little bit differently mm -hmm. unless who knows maybe g-lo could hit some function this button that made it look visually different because i know he did that for his movie invaders but i think that was the camera we yeah. saw in the background i think we left. may i think we, we even may have been um i don't i don't know like we may have been using different is that the camera right there on the left of the screen could, it could right be. there that yeah it keeps coming into the shot it could be yeah. We, may, we may have been using this just for a different perspective because here we're looking at it from the perspective, the perspective of the actual um, the killer. But is is this Gilo's camera? Or is this Th your this camera? This is probably mine. Oh, okay, because I know there's a there's a function that Gilo's camera had that could make it look like this. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember his movie in the Invaders. Mm -hmm. He just kept hitting that switch, and the quality of the video kept changing mm -hmm. um, while he was shooting the Invaders mm -hmm. in the final cut of it. Mm -hmm. um, that's the movie he did. But yeah, I just used this particular take because it showed, this was the closest we got to like the the action. Mm -hmm. So I figured I'd show a little bit of more, you know, TNA in some of these deleted scenes. Because we, we, we didn't have the camera um, 
you know, the night before or the day before. We, we had never used it. Like, I had just looked at it. I, I, I didn't even know anything about the damn thing. I didn't have the instruction manual. But I think at that point, I was just so, like, you know, so confident. I was like, yeah, just give me the camera, cut it on, and shoot it. Because most cameras are kind of easy to just use. But this one was a little bit more complicated because it was a definite... This was, this was, at the time, the DVX was a big step forward for cameras. It was very different from a lot of the, the camcorders that were around prior to it. It was far more cinema-like. So um, there were functions on it that I just never, I never saw before. Like most cameras didn't have two audio inputs, so you didn't have to worry about that. But this camera with two audio inputs, and then you could switch it between like a, a, a microphone inside of the camera versus an exterior mic that you use with a line. I mean, I, when we first saw that, I, I didn't know what any of it was. So it, 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 we wasted a good portion of the morning. The lesson we learned is like always have your equipment tested out and ready to go before you shoot because any little loss, like a one hour loss on the beach in the morning is a difference between you probably getting two or three scenes done or even one or two scenes done versus like nothing because people start showing up on the beach and then it's over. Yeah, it's not just the um the, the what the scenes you lose, it's the momentum you, you lose as well. Because it, it's just like, you know, you're running a race, you know, it's like if you stop running, it takes you a while to just get back warmed up and get that momentum going, you know. You start off a day, you got the adrenaline pump in, I mean you can you can go and gun, you know, that one hour, you can get a lot done and you can use that adrenaline to keep going. You know, after just dealing with that audio issue it took a while to get started because it's just like it took all of your adrenaline out of you you know it's just like okay now let's see what we can get done at this point yeah I and mean, as soon as we started people were showing up so it was like shit you know like let's go on to the next scene yeah let's get out of here and go to the next location yeah. Yeah, it was just a tough time plus we, we you know we really had a certain momentum and a certain flow from the first three projects that we did and going into this one like six or seven months later being kind of cold and getting back trying to get back into the flow it definitely wasn't um it wasn't easy it seemed like a, like a, we're starting from scratch again this area right here i mean um i i think i mentioned this on on a few podcasts we did before but um a tricky thing about shooting at, at this area is that the shoreline would cover up this entire area at certain times of day so um we had to deal with that as well with a few of the locations we shot at mm. is that sometimes it'd be covered in water and then sometimes it would it wouldn't so um we were actually lucked out here that we had that space but if you guys look at it you could see like where the grass is there would be no way to walk around there mm -hmm. so certain areas were blocked off for us as well mm -hmm. So. And you can hear the constant roar of like the jet planes. These are not the little kitty jet planes. These are like real planes landing in um you know. Oh, titties. Oh, nice. These are like uh, planes landing in like JFK Airport. And the thing about shooting in New York City is you don't think of planes, you know, like fucking up your audio when you shoot. Uh, but when you well, when you're writing scripts or just in general, like you know, you're in New York all day, you don't really hear planes. Like there's a lot of noise. But fun, but so, for, for some strange reason, when you're shooting films, you hear planes like every five seconds. It's like wow, like I don't really hear planes when I'm walking down the street or when I'm driving in my car or when I'm like in Manhattan. But trust me, when you when you start shooting films in New York, you become very aware of like jet planes. When you put on those headphones, you start listening to the audio. It's like man, it's like just constantly every five minutes you, you'll, you'll hear a jet plane going by in any neighborhood you you are especially in the outer boroughs and then you then also in, in certain days depending on which direction the wind is blowing the planes are landing coming in all in a certain direction and this particular day just 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 you know just because of i guess our luck the planes were all coming like right over our head and landing right in jfk airport which is just a couple of miles from this location so we were getting hit with like, you know, TWA and American Airlines, plus the toy jets. I mean, plus bad weather, plus un people who were unreliable. We were just taking it from every direction on this, plus batteries that didn't work, a camera we weren't fully familiar with, struggles about cinematography. Um, not to cut you off, but speaking of taking it from all type of directions, here comes uh, a girl who likes to take it from the back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> here comes our... Uh, well, not our first appearance, because she was in the group scene where they were seeing Gilligan's Island, but here's uh, Backdoor Michelle. Yeah. 
Yeah. Introducing back to Michelle. Yeah. Who was um debut. who was made famous in um, Lust for Vengeance, um, with a, a hot scene in the beginning. With famous Holly. or infamous, mm. either way. <laughs> but, but yeah, to to get into the little plot of the movie here, it's this is a, a the, the movie is based around a group of friends who take a boat, I guess, to an island on vacation or a yacht. Something like that. Something like it. It's been a while since I wrote it. But they, they end up, the boats end up crashing, and they get stranded on the island. I, the thing about it was, there was areas of, of uh, Floyd Bennett Field where there were shipwrecked boats. Mm-hmm. And we were just going to shoot some footage of that, and mm-hmm. it was going to look pretty, you know, pretty decent, you know. It looked somewhat realistic, like, oh, these guys had a budget. Look at an actual shipwrecked boat. That's what I kept thinking, but... Um, among other things that, you know, that whole aspect of it fell apart as well. Yeah. Yeah, actually in the, in the background, if you just keep walking straight back, there were a couple of, um, shipwrecked boats back there. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, these characters, they, I mean, they basically spend a lot of the movie bickering amongst each other and various characters end up hooking up and having sex and, um, there was supposed to be like this, um, island boy watching them and um, stalking them and then killing them off one by one and then eventually Brian would get off the island um, but yeah unfortunately we didn't get to too many of the love scenes we do have a hot hot lesbian action coming up later but you can hear a humming a humming of a toy plane in the background here yeah. just constant like we, we, we just couldn't get through a scene without having some kind of disruption now you can see the scene suddenly gets brighter because of the sun yeah. I mean it's just like you yeah, can't lighting was a huge issue you can't win I mean it, clouds you, listen to the humming even if she was hot for someone else it sure as heck ain't gonna be one of us you hear the humming lighting's changing tough situation these planes are gonna be a serious problem what? these planes are gonna be a serious the problem planes? you're not recording right? yeah I am Dude, now, okay. Mr. Weathers, tell me exactly what's going to happen in this next scene. Two. I'm trying to talk serious here. No, let's talk. Talk to me real serious, man. Project Greenlight. The planes are going to be a problem. What the else? The planes are going to be a serious problem. Why? Because we got to shoot some more scenes here. It's going to be tough to match up what we got right now. And we already burned too much tape and too many takes because of those planes. Yeah? Yeah. It's going to be a serious fucking problem. So talk to me about what's going to happen in this scene right here. You'll see for yourself. Oh, come on, man. Give me some. Give me some. Give me a breakdown. What is the scene establishing? You ask too many fucking questions. See, man, this is for our, this is for the DVD, man. Talk to me. What's the scene all about? Oh, God. What's it all about? It's about love. Yeah. And heartbreak. But who are these two characters, and what's their what's their their, their situation? The situation right now is one character is very stressed out, and the other character is helping to relieve that stress. Okay. By doing what? By helping. Helping? Yeah, okay. So, George, what's your view of, of what's happening so far today? I didn't know the audio was going to be that much of a problem with this camera. Yeah? But, um, we finally got it working, so... So, audio turned out to be a big deal, huh? Um, I didn't know you had to mix those two lines. Mm-hmm. But it's a good camera, so <laughs> it's going to give us what we want. Yeah. How long did it take for the audio situation to resolve? Um, the audio, 10, 15 minutes. It's a long time. Um, yeah, it's a long time, but it's worth it. So what kind of camera is this? This is a Panasonic AG. This is the DVX100. This is the first camera that can actually give you the 24p film look. Mm-hmm. But it's not going to be the last. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a whole host of cameras out there. I understand that Sony is actually going to do one. Mm-hmm. Which, um, they're gonna give you more options than this. Mm-hmm. And um, you know Panasonic's gonna upgrade what they have. Mm-hmm. So that's not gonna be a big deal. Magnavox is gonna do a version. Mm-hmm. And um, of course, Canon mm-hmm. is gonna do a version. Mm-hmm. Um, all of them are geared toward the indie filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Sony already understands what the market is for digital. Mm-hmm. They were at the DV Expo this past February. Mm-hmm. They had a booth, they talked about the equipment. There's going to be accessories for this, um, uh, a better lens. Um, this is very good. This is a very good um, lens, but they are talking about more accessories like a telephoto. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't exactly know the specifics, mm-hmm. but um, 
a lot of interchangeable lenses, a lot of other accessories that this camera does not have at the moment. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to be good for guys like us. It's going to be pretty good. It's going to have um, a lot of independent filmmakers now have more options. Pretty soon, a budget is not even going to be a consideration for the independent filmmaker. Cool. This is this is the first one. Well, this is this is the the one that set the trend that took independent filmmakers from basically like a 30 frame digital thing to a, a type of camera that shoots just like film. That shoots exactly like film. <clears throat> this is the first one. We're, we're, we're trend setting. One of, <laughs> one of the first people to do a movie on this stuff. We <laughs> won't be the last. One. All right, guys. Thanks for watching, man. Mm. You know, escape from Bloodbath Island. Why would you want to escape an island like that? <laughs> <laughs>